This is a long overdue video and one that came up in response to a Facebook discussion just this past weekend concerning the ending of Alfred Hitchcock's Shadow of a Doubt and whether or not the last line should be considered Jack Graham's final speech to young Charlie Newton. He said that people like us had no idea what the world was really like. That has long after the well, it's not quite as bad as that. But sometimes it needs a lot of watching. It seems to go crazy every now and then. Like your Uncle Charlie. Or the off-screen sermon heard from outside the church, which are in fact the final words heard in the film. The beauty of their souls, the sweetness of their characters, live on with us forever. Thematically, of course, Reverend McCurdy's sermon is entirely appropriate to the narrative, speaking to the secret that young Charlie will forever carry about the tarnished image of her beloved uncle. And although both the final moments of Thornton Wilder's handwritten early draft of the screenplay and the changed final pages of the final shooting script carry the reverence uh, lines of dialogue, the first lines of the sermon, there's uh, no doubt that the words were very definitely scripted and were by no means happenstance. But we hope you'll all forget we're here. In referencing back to the script material for the film's final tag, I was reminded of some of the subtle changes, or rather omissions, that occurred in bringing the script's last two sequences to the screen. The way the film is laid out now, while the Newton family and Uncle Charlie are attending the women's club meeting where Uncle Charlie is giving his lecture, young Charlie tries contacting Detective Jack Graham to let him know that her uncle is the man he's been searching for. Unable to reach him, she searches for and finds the evidence that forces Uncle Charlie's retreat when he announces that he's leaving Santa Rosa. You're just in time for a farewell toast. The next morning, however, he makes one final attempt to rid himself of his niece who knows too much, and in the struggle, he meets a gruesome demise. Uncle Charlie is mourned by the town of Santa Rosa, and nobody is any the wiser that he is the actual Merry Widow murderer, except young Charlie and Jack Graham. Now, while this is a perfect climax for the Santa movie, Rosa both the original construction and that Hitchcock and Thornton Wilder laid out, and the final changes to the final shooting script are slightly different. As scripted, young Charlie stays behind at the house and it tries telephoning Jack Graham, and the script cross-cuts to Uncle Charlie making his speech at the women's club. Young Charlie finds the incriminating emerald ring and reveals it to her uncle, forcing his decision to leave Santa Rosa. And the next morning, the scene begins with detectives Jack Graham and Fred Saunders at the train station, which means young Charlie did rat out her uncle. Moments later, as the train leaves the station and Uncle Charlie gets his niece alone, the script calls for a shot of Graham and Saunders, also on the train, moving in on Uncle Charlie to apprehend him once the train is out of Santa Rosa. The struggle between uncle and niece takes place as in the film, but the script makes it quite clear that young Charlie pushes Uncle Charlie to his death. So it appears that in the editing it was decided to omit any references to Graham and Saunders boarding the train so that they could arrest Uncle Charlie once he's outside of Santa Rosa. I believe Hitchcock wisely eliminated the chase aspect here, more or less leaving it ambiguous as to whether or not young Charlie finally did contact the detectives. This sets up the possibility that she may just go ahead and allow Uncle Charlie to escape and live with her own guilt of whether or not he's going to claim any more victims. Also, it puts young Charlie in greater peril as she's going to have to face Uncle Charlie down uh, in his final attempt to uh, get rid of her, which she does successfully. For better or worse, Uncle Charlie's visit to Santa Rosa awakens young Charlie from her peaceful slumber in an idyllic Thornton Wilder-esque town to find herself, as Hitchcock said, in a more modern version, a small town lit by neon signs. In effect, he's let her know that she too has a dark side, a theme Hitchcock would explore again in Strangers on a Train and Frenzy. Now, while the double theme in Shadow of a Doubt has been discussed ad nauseum, I'd like to point out another visual and verbal motif that Hitchcock has at work in the film. In writing with Hitchcock, I point out how Hitchcock used images of and references to hands as a recurring motif in To Catch a Thief. You have a very strong grip, the kind of burglar needs. He does the very same thing in Shadow of a Doubt. First, let's take a look at Hitchcock's own cameo holding 13 spades in a game of bridge. Not quite the deadliest hands in the film, but certainly a tip-off of what's to follow. Next, we have Uncle Charlie grabbing young Charlie's hands when he gives her the ring that will come back to haunt him later. Later, in a pair of close-ups, Uncle Charlie's hands are seen knocking over a glass so that young Charlie will not mention the words Merry Widow and so that he could destroy an incriminating newspaper article. Again, in a scene that mirrors when Uncle Charlie gives young Charlie the ring, he grabs young Charlie's hands when she holds the newspaper clipping. 
In the scene where Emma Newton tells her brother that two men from the government want to interview the family, watch Uncle Charlie's hands as he unconsciously tears apart a slice of toast, almost suggesting that Uncle Charlie has an uncontrollable impulse when it comes to his hands. We later see his hands twisting a napkin when he gets agitated as his niece confronts him in the Till 2 bar. And yet again, when he lets a cigar fall out of his hands as the impulse to kill young Charlie begins to grow within. The motif is even carried forward with other characters. As Uncle Charlie flirts with the widow, Mrs. Potter, she fiddles with her wedding ring, which of course foreshadows the tracking shot to young Charlie's hand, revealing the incriminating ring as it slides down the banister. There are even more references and visuals than that, but clearly you can see why Hitchcock most often cited Shadow of a Doubt as the favorite among his own films. Although he did on occasion mention The Trouble with Harry and Rear Window as well. But that's another story. Thanks for watching.